So enrolling into a gene therapy trial has similarities to other clinical trials that people may have been involved in, whether that be extended half-life or other factor trials. Uh, that would be about a conversation about uh, whether they're eligible, uh, reading the patient information sheet to ensure that they had the full background of the trial and having ample time to ask questions of the clinical trial team. Ultimately, for any clinical trial, uh, a patient will need to sign a consent form to say that they understand the trial structure, the requirements and the risk. Uh, and that's where the gene therapy side of a clinical trial is different to some of the other trials because you end up consenting into a trial that's quite unique. Medicine, when it's infused into you, uh, can't be taken out again. So it's very different to an extended half-life that uh, once one's been given, it will fade away very quickly before the next infusion of EHL is given, whereas uh, with gene therapy, it lasts forever. Uh, so it's very different in thinking about consenting to the trial. And this is really, for me as a clinician, the most important thing that an individual understands, that once it's in, there's no way of neutralizing or putting it to an end once it's in your body. Um, so uh, this is where it's so different to other trials uh, that uh, you can't uh, opt out of the gene therapy. Uh, so this is something that makes the, the clinicians nervous and I would imagine makes individuals considering the trials nervous as well. Um, it's impressive to see the number of men who have stepped forward who've wanted to participate in the trials to date, uh, both in the UK and elsewhere in the world, uh, who have been happy to take uh, this risk on. And fortunately to date, you know, the trials have been progressing well. But it's an absolutely important message uh, that once it's in, it can't be retrieved and taken out again. So ahead of uh, the infusion of the gene therapy, uh, there are no particular special requirements. There's no requirement of liver biopsy. There's no uh, additional um, invasive procedures. Uh, the infusion of the gene therapy itself is very simple via a vein in the arm, uh, which is infused during the day. Uh, and generally, people would be able to be discharged the same day or certainly after a single overnight stay. So uh, I think the actual logistics of uh, once consented and then having gene therapy delivered is pretty simple. After the gene therapy has actually been administered, uh, the team will watch the expression of the given factor very closely. Um, there'll be multiple time points uh, in, in a given week uh, and, and over the first months to watch the factor uh, as to how it's expressed. Depending on the different trials, there may be subtle differences as to how quickly the factor is expressed, but it's certainly uh, weeks and months, not days and, and weeks. Thinking about the uh, factor expression level after gene therapy is an important uh, consideration uh, when you're thinking about participating in a clinical trial. The different uh, platforms, so the different companies bringing trials to uh, your centre uh, may have different targets, uh, they may have different doses, and even for the same company there may be a choice between a high dose and an intermediate dose or lower dose. Um, so this is an important conversation to have uh, and to ask your clinical team and the trials team uh, what the different platforms mean by uh, a high dose or a low dose uh, and often to ask how they compare to a different trial maybe even if that trial is not open in that centre. Uh, so the difference between gene therapy trials and some of the other factor trials um, is that often a centre may only open one trial for gene therapy rather than multiple um, but just because that trial is open does not necessarily mean that's the right trial for you at your centre. So I think it's important to feel confident to ask questions, not just about the trial that is open at your centre, but how that trial compares to other trials available in your country.
So after gene therapy, there is a risk of a reduction in the expressed factor level. Um, and in some trials, this has happened quite soon uh, after the infusion. This may be related to some liver function tests becoming elevated and uh, sometimes requiring steroids uh, to treat. It also seems from published data that uh, factor levels in other trials settle after uh, a longer period of time, maybe after a couple of years, to lower levels than was seen in the early months after gene therapy. The question then is whether this matters um, and whether the settled level is still sufficient to protect the individual from bleeds um, and whether it's really uh, gone back to a proper severe haemophilia or whether it's left the individual with mild haemophilia that may still be uh, very protective against bleeds. Uh, so this will need to be considered on a case-to-case -case basis, um, but uh, if the factor level went all the way back to uh, severe form, uh, the unfortunate situation is that you cannot be redosed with the same gene therapy and it may be the case that you can't be redosed with other AAV gene therapies either. Um, but this is again a, an area of research and we're uncertain about the cross-reactivity of antibodies against the different types of adeno-associated viral vectors. So for those that uh, have levels that are uh, still moderate or mild haemophilia levels, uh, there will be times that they need additional factor top-ups and this theoretically could be a standard half-life or uh, an extended half-life product uh, and we would have no concerns about that. The requirements uh, after the gene therapy uh, has actually been infused is quite time consuming for the individual who's received the gene therapy. So depending on the trial there will be multiple visits to uh, the uh, haemophilia centre, uh, the trial centre that's uh, overseeing uh, all the sample collection and that's going to be multiple blood samples um, and that in the first weeks and months will sometimes be more than once a week. Uh, and then also uh, collection of bodily fluids, so that would be uh, saliva, uh, urine, semen and stool uh, would be collected. And this is an important part of the trial that people need to be aware of as to whether they're prepared to do that. But it's scientifically important uh, and that's the, the reason we need to understand uh, how the virus escapes the body, its so-called viral shedding uh, and how long it survives in the body and how it escapes from the body in the different body fluids. The individual undertaking gene therapy uh, will need to uh, listen carefully and, and discuss uh, how the gene therapy trial might impact on their personal relations with their partner um, and certainly the conversation about contraception and the requirement for contraception over a prolonged period of time. Uh, so certainly anyone considering starting a family in the near future, it's an important consideration as to whether the time is, is right for them. And the reason why contraception would be important would be because of the risk of the virus being shed in the semen uh, out of the man uh, and the unknown risk to their partner uh, if they were trying to get pregnant. Um, so for the, the guys with female partners that uh, are, are thinking about families, this is a, a very important uh, consideration. So the eligibility criteria for enrolling into gene therapy trials have similarities to some of the factor trials uh, of, of years past. Uh, so currently uh, it is adults uh, for gene therapy. Uh, there's no paediatric studies yet. Uh, the, the main issue will be a, around liver health as well. So uh, the individuals need to be free of hepatitis C uh, in, a, in a sustained virological response from the hepatitis C treatment uh, and that their liver is in uh, good health as judged by a fibro scan normally. So a scan uh, that is not needing an actual biopsy of the liver, uh, but many individuals will have had these uh, scans done to assess their liver. Uh, and that would certainly be done to assess liver health. There'd be the usual blood tests uh, to assess liver health as well. Um, currently, different uh, 
trials may have different criteria around uh, HIV, uh, and in some trials that's a, a pause exclusion at the moment, and there's thought uh, about whether uh, this would be an ex a, a true exclusion or not. A key uh, thought is about inhibitor status, uh, so similar to the factor trials of times past, uh, with, without an inhibitor history uh, and with uh, very clear blood tests and recent blood tests, one of which that will have been done in the central laboratory to demonstrate that there's no current inhibitor. The long-term exclusion in the real world, if and when gene therapy gets to market, uh, you know, we obviously will need to understand how these groups that are currently excluded uh, may or may not get access to, to gene therapy. So currently, uh, the group of women who may have severe hemophilus is a very, very small group uh, and are currently not eligible for trial. There are clearly women who live with haemophilia, uh, but th that tends to be mild or moderate haemophilia, uh, and that's an exclusion to current gene therapy trials. The challenge in the field at the moment is uh, thinking about rare disorders beyond haemophilia A and B, but currently the only gene therapy trials are for haemophilia A and B. So although there is a need in the wider community for thought about gene therapy, uh, there are not the clinical trials open or imminently coming to, to uh, the centres uh, for trial participants with rare disorders. So I get asked in clinic quite a lot about mild and moderate haemophilia as to whether they would be eligible for gene therapy. And disappointingly for them at the moment, they're not eligible. Um, but I think it raises an interesting question if uh, gene therapy is available to the most severe individuals, those then with uh, the variation of moderate haemophilia A or B clearly will start to think that they uh, should be eligible and I think this will be an ongoing conversation. Currently, they're not eligible for, for gene therapy. So currently, the age criteria for enrolment in gene therapy trials is uh, for adults only. Uh, and understandably, there is uh, caution within the community uh, about progressing into uh, adolescence and certainly to younger children. Theoretically, the, the the best people to treat would be the youngest patients with gene therapy. So philosophically, the earlier the gene can be corrected or, um, or replaced, then that would give advantage to uh, the young boy with potential severe haemophilia. Uh, so I think we need to continue to watch the adult progress very uh, carefully. Uh, and clearly from the original UCL St. Jude's trial uh, back at nearly 10 years ago uh, and then the more recent trials uh, we have a good number of adults who have had years of experience now with gene therapy uh, so I think there's an ongoing conversation about when younger adults, adolescents and then children might be eligible. So in my opinion, gene therapy uh, emerging as a new therapy for haemophilia uh, brings great opportunity for the community. Um, this comes at the same time as other novel agents come into market, other modified factor 8s and factor 9s, as well as our standard uh, half-life uh, factors that we've used for so many years uh, with great safety and, and great effect. So in my view, all of this landscape change brings opportunity uh, but I don't think there's going to be one treatment that becomes uh, so dominant that the other treatments will disappear. Individuals uh, and their families will need to decide which factor suits them best for their haemophilia. Uh, and certainly already within departments we're seeing uh, the variety of opinion about gene therapy, that some are super keen to get involved, others are interested but happy for others to proceed, and others are very happy uh, to hear about it uh, but have no intention of actually receiving it. So 
I think this is likely to reflect what happens in the next decade uh, as all of these new therapies, including gene therapy, uh, progress, uh, that there will be a spectrum of enthusiasm both from the individuals, families and the treating teams in hospitals as to what treatment is right for the right patient at the right time.